So far, we've defined the Black Lives Matter movement. We've laid out what we believe is the role of police. So now comes the uncomfortable task of change. So I'll open with this. When a white person realizes that they finally get what we mean by Black Lives Matter, what exactly do we then want them to do? I think it's a matter of human rights and we need to change the narrative that it's a political stance. Um, Black Lives Matter isn't political. Black lives should matter. It's a human rights issue. We don't get to choose our race like you can choose a political party um, or like you can choose a profession. It's, it's how you're born. It's what you're raised as. It's your heritage. Um, I think once a white person finally gets it or thinks that they get it, that it's their job to become an ally. It's their job to become anti-racist and work towards it. Um, and it's tough. I, I mentioned it before, like muscle doesn't grow without pain. It's going to be tough now that you're now that you've woken up and you see everything that other people have had to deal with their whole life, like people are tired. We've been protesting for a week, two weeks. Like my friends are very tired. I'm tired. We're all tired. But again, it's been two weeks as opposed to someone's entire life or this, this country's whole history. Like it, it's not going to end next week. It's not going to end with a bill being passed. It's not going to be end with cops being locked up. It's going to keep going. We have to keep fighting. And that this, this is just the beginning. It's not a, oh, I finally get it. Now it's over. It's okay. Now it can begin because you finally get it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think, I think they need to continue having these tough conversations uh, because you're right. It's not going to, you know, it, it didn't start yesterday or at George Floyd and it's not going to end there. Um, but, you know, you need to recognize where you stand with that. Um, and, and just do better in terms of having the, those tough conversations with your, your family, you know, your inner circle, and, you know, force them to have the conversations with, with their family, with their inner circle. And then also, you know, within, within your workplace, you know, just look around. We talked about diversity. Um, if, if the people, you know, that, that you serve aren't, aren't reflective in where you work, then, you know, that's also part of the issue. Um, so we, we, we need to have people who, who have a, a diverse voice um, in positions that allow for us to, to make uh, changes, so. Mm -hmm. I think for me, it's very simply put, do something. Just do something. Educate people around you, sign petitions, amplify black voices, donate, protest, share stuff on social media, be actively anti-racist. It's right now, it's just about don't burn out once you figure all this out, don't burn out, but don't also let this become a trend. This has to be a way of life. Civil rights is not a trend. These protests are not a trend. And it's, I've seen a lot of nonsense on social media with influencers doing all these weird photo ops. This isn't a trend. This is people's lives. This is people's lives that are on the line. So just do something, start with something and then it can grow. I just, you know, every time, uh, Carrie Ann, you said uh, diet um, racism. racism. I, I just go back to that commercial with uh, Kendall Jenner when she's like handing <laughs> handed the pet food to. Yeah. I, I don't know why that always just sticks with me, but you know, you're right. We we cannot make this a trend or a hashtag. And you know, as much as people like to just hashtag and roll back over and go on with the rest of the day, this this is very, you know, very real thing, and it's a human rights issue, like you all have, have said. So yeah, definitely not making this a fad or something that you know we can just put in a tweet and just roll over and forget about. You know, mm -hmm. we, we have to continue to do our part, you know, collectively and individually to make this thing work. Absolutely. The Black Square Instagram made me feel a lot of feelings um, that whole day. Pretty much, I. It was just it was people share. It's a it's a conflicted emotion that I feel. It's the people sharing that have never felt that way before, or if I see people sharing it, and I know those are people that have like said something dumb to me before, whether like I don't act black or like I don't have black hair, and I see those people sharing the black square and using the hashtags, and I'm like, okay, I need to believe that people can change. I need to trust in that, but. 
it's like the day before they were acting foolish and then the day after they were acting foolish as well and it hurts it hurts to see that like you know people are using it as a trend and Mm -hmm. I've really appreciated the brands that I follow who have dedicated their feed now to calling out things and to being actively anti-racist I'm sad it took this long um similar to like just the the tattoo studio I, I go to I'm sad it took this long but I'm I'm happy it's happening um, and with influencers making it a whole thing, there's the account influencers in the wild, and they've made it their effort to call people out now. And they've been showing just influencers who kind of dress up, like the protests are Coachella, and they dress up and they go and they get their photo op and then they run away. And it's it's disheartening to see that. It's yeah, it's sad. It's something I I knew would happen, but I didn't expect to actually see it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think a great part about that black boxing is a, it opened up conversation for why it was problematic and what you needed to do if you were going to do that because that was a big mm-hmm. thing for me I was like it's fine if you want to post that do not hashtag black lives matter because you're blocking out a lot of really important information a b add action items to it action items are huge it's okay if you want to like because at the end of the day someone posting about it is someone else that's going to hear about it so I try not to take too many deep issues with it because I think that it only ends up doing a disservice to myself personally and said, I'm like, okay, if you're going to do that add action items, where can people find petitions? Where can people donate? Where can people add those other things to kind of get that conversation moving? If you want to be performative, at least add some helpful information while you're at it. I think as that Tuesday went on, that's what I saw when I woke up that morning for work. It was just the square and maybe maybe no caption or maybe black lives matter. And as the day went on, I was like, okay, we shouldn't be, posting the hashtag like this is why this is why it's bad and I would reach out to friends and we adjusted it a lot of people did mute it or the uh, like other hashtags and as the day ended it was more it was less of a black square and more of maybe a darker image with links or a darker image with a petition or link in my bio something Mm -hmm. like that and that was a good feeling that over the course of one day we still made a difference we made a change Mm -hmm. from you know, 8 a.m. in the morning to 8 p.m. at night, there was such a visible change and a shift in the perspective people on the internet had. So another question is, why is race so uncomfortable to talk about with most people? This is kind of tough to answer. Um, it Race is a pretty sensitive topic, no matter what race you're talking about. It can be white, it can be Hispanic, it can be Asian. All of us have went through our own problems. So and it's it can be because the other race has probably done it to us you know like obviously with black people it seems to be you know whites who have caused us these problems and and in america in general it seems to be whites why because that's what the government was back in the 1800s and the 1900s it was majority white people so like when it comes to like native americans who were on the land before um, you know um british came over and took over it was native americans and native americans didn't get citizenship until i believe 1925 and they've been around pretty much since the beginning you know and it's it it kind of makes sense on why they're uncomfortable talking about it but it's also something that needs to be touched like okay we need to stop racism like, it's always going to be a problem, but we need to find a way to fight against it and find a solution. And I, that's how I feel about it. Um, and, no, uh, is it? I have a lot of white friends, and I know it can be a pretty sensitive topic to them, too. So I don't generally pick it up or bring it up, but it's something that does need to be talked about. So for me, race is an uncomfortable subject to talk about because of white fragility, period. That's what it is for me. Um, Because at the end of the day, we talk about race all the time. Any person of color outside of even just black people, race is in your life. You are talking about it. You are aware of it. You are dealing with things every single day. The only people it doesn't necessarily involve are the people who are seen as the norm. That's, again, where privilege comes in. And so for me, it's white fragility is what makes race un- uncomfortable. I'm not unco- None of us are uncomfortable talking about race because we experience these racial prejudices, right? So a lot of the ki- things that I'm seeing is that people are just unwilling to admit their racial biases that they have 
that have been perpetuated and empowered by not only just media, but like your home life, your teaching, you know, how many black authors were you reading in your AP English class? Probably none. How many female authors were you reading in your AP English class? Probably none. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a very deep issue and it's something where like you, I don't, my opinion is you don't get to be uncomfortable talking about race if you benefit from a society that has re essentially radicalized anyone who is brown fighting for themselves, right? So in my opinion, it's, it's white fragility and that's what makes it uncomfortable because it's not uncomfortable for anyone who's brown. Anyone who's brown lives it. We're all cool talking about it. The only people who get uncomfortable tend to be white. That's a good point. You know, it's, it's, it's those hard truths that are hard to swallow that, you know, or, you know, they grew up not being fully educated on, on these things. You know, we, we have a school system that only tells us about slavery, uh, you know, the civil rights movement and Barack Obama, you know, it's like, Oh, in between we and, solved it yeah it's like we, we we've gotten over it we're over the hump and you know it, it, that, that that speaks to a bigger issue you know and in terms of why racism is ingrained in the education system you know we we should there should not be an elective to talk about black history you know we shouldn't we shouldn't have to need a black history month to tell you about the history we do. And then even, even that is like, well, why do you need that? And it's like, <laughs> there's a bigger, bigger, you know, problem here. So if we, um, I don't know, you know, race is difficult, like you said, to, to swallow because of that discomfort that, you know, white America has when, when dealing with it, you know, and it's like, Oh, well get over it. Or, or you're playing the race card, but, no, we can't just get over it because we don't go away or we just because we're not looking at just because we don't pay attention doesn't mean the problem is not still there, you know. So yeah, that's my point. It's my skin color. It doesn't go away. It right. it is what it is. Mm -hmm. Um I think I, I agree with the white fragility. I think it comes with a lack of control. Um some conversations I've had with some white friends are like, well yeah, that happened in the past and they feel a lot of guilt because of it because it's their, their people, I guess. And they weren't there, they could have stood up back then, they can't change it. And it's like, well, why can't we just move on now? It's like, well, well we're trying, but still nothing has changed. That's, that's the thing. And it's just, it, it keeps coming back to, it shouldn't be political. It shouldn't, mm -hmm. it shouldn't be a fragile subject. Like they're, my therapist is Mexican and we talk about race all the time because of, family values between Hispanic culture and black culture. We talk about family stuff all the time. We talk about our lives. We talk about pride and different, like different things that we have to deal with because of the color of our skin that others don't. And I'm, I'm thankful that that's the person that whose lap I fell into with therapy, but I don't know. I feel like I wouldn't feel comfortable if I had a therapist that was white talking about racial, racial issues. Cause I don't want them telling me how to feel. Show me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. Show me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. Show me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. Show me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like.